Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see our chapel filling up, for everyone to be coming back together. I know for some of you, this is certainly a Shehechianu moment. Uh, so we're actually going to start with Shehechianu. I know some have expressed that this is the first time you've been here in two years. So if you'll join me, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu, Vikiyamanu, Vehigianu, Lazman Haza. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, for giving us life for sustaining us and for enabling us to reach this day. Amen. So as most of you know, I'm Rabbi Susan Shankman. Uh, I am delighted to be here this morning and to be here with you in person. And we also know that there are those joining us on the live stream or perhaps watching this later. And I'd like to welcome you to Washington Hebrew Congregation's Amram Scholar Series and our first annual Leslie Maitland Lecture. This morning, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. James McCauley, who I will refer to as James as instructed from here on out, followed by a discussion that will be moderated by Leslie Maitland. Leslie wants me to make sure that you all know that I twisted her arm a little bit to get her to moderate today. I know so many of us have loved learning with and hearing from Leslie over the years, and it seemed fitting to have her moderate on this day uh, because we will, following our discussion, we will honor Leslie for her 23 years of volunteer service coordinating the Amram Scholar Series. So before we begin this morning's lecture, a little bit of background about the Amram Scholar Series. The Amram Scholar Series of Washington Hebrew Congregation offers a stimulating program of free lectures throughout the year in which world-renowned speakers, authors, scholars, political leaders, policy analysts, and theologians share their perspectives on timely issues or their research into history. The program traces its beginnings to the fall of 1954 when the congregation moved here to Macomb Street. That fall, participating in a nationwide celebration that marked the tercentenary, the 300th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States, Washington Hebrew launched what would become this widely recognized Sunday morning lecture program. The Amram Scholar Series, as we know it, was founded a decade later in 1963 with an endowment from the estate of Adolf Amram and donations from Temple families. Following this morning's lecture, you will hear more about Leslie Maitland's contributions as chair of the Amram Scholar Series from 1998 to 2021. And one of her major contributions was partnering with the Jewish Book Council to bring in engaging authors like this morning's guest, Dr. James McCauley. Today's lecture is in partnership with the Jewish Book Council. And if you have not already purchased James's book, The House of Fragile Things, you will have the opportunity to do so at the conclusion on your way to lifting a glass at our champagne brunch and toast in honor of Leslie Maitland prior to our empty nesters brunch. So about our guest today, Dr. James McCauley, I know I promised I was going to refer to you as James from then, but Dr. James McCauley is a global opinions contributing columnist for the Washington Post after having been Paris correspondent from 2016 to 2021. He is also a contributor to the New York Review of Books. He received, received his BA in History and Literature from Harvard University and a PhD in French History from the University of Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar. His first book, The House of Fragile Things, just won this year's National Jewish Book Award in History. It explores the role art and material culture played in the assimilation and identity of French Jews before World War II. His book has been described as engrossing, deeply researched, and elegantly written, astute and perceptive, a moving portrait of a glittering, doomed world, a comprehensive and accessible account of one of the great communal acts of generosity and then betrayal in modern history. I can attest to that. I know some have already said on their way in how much they enjoyed reading the book. We encourage you, if you have not, to um, take that opportunity. And I believe it's coming out in paperback as well soon. And we are so thrilled to welcome James to Washington Hebrew. And I know he is excited for this in-person event, given that his book came out during COVID. This is actually a Shehechianu moment for him as well, as it is his first in-person live people uh, interacting uh, and to be able to be here. And so we are so honored and so thrilled to welcome you, James, to Washington Hebrew Congregation. And so I welcome Dr. James McCauley to our BIMA. Thank you. 
Uh, well, um, thank you so much, Rabbi Shankman, for that very kind introduction. Thank you to Leslie for putting this all in motion and for all the work that you have done, and congratulations to you. And thank you to every single one of you for, for being here with us this morning. I mean, um, as Rabbi Shankman said, it's a, it means so much to me because um, you know, when, when you take the time to research and write a book and to have it come out and then everything be virtual, you know, you really, you wanna be out in the world and, and meet people and it just means so, so much to me that you're all here today, so thank you so much. Um, can, can everybody hear me okay? It's fine? Okay, up like that? Okay, there we go, okay. Now we're in business. Um, but anyway, thank you all so, so much for being here. Um, it means so much to me. And um, yeah, so I'm here to talk to you today about the book, which is called The House of Fragile Things. Um, before I begin the little presentation I have telling sort of one central story from it, I thought I would just sort of talk a little bit in general about the entire project and what it's really about. And it's essentially a group biography of five French Jewish families, um, following them from the end of the 19th century up through the Second World War and the Holocaust in France. And um, it, there's been a lot written on both the Dreyfus Affair and the Vichy government and the Holocaust in France, but I was fascinated by the kind of particular red thread of the art collections and sort of how did I come across that topic? Well, um, as a child, I went to, I was dragged, um, I should say, um, by my parents to the Camondo Museum, which if I'm sure some of you have been. Um, for those of you who have not, it is a kind of gorgeous jewel box museum in Paris off of the Parc Monceau. And it's um, a museum of 18th century decorative arts. It's a real kind of masterpiece if that is your thing. And you know, it's a, a must see for students of art history, so on and so forth. But it's also something else, and that is, a, um, it's a family house that belonged to a Jewish family whose son had died fighting for France in the First World War and then whose daughter and grandchildren were all murdered in the Second World War. And you know, coming um, from a Jewish background myself, I was really struck by that and was sort of haunted by it. And I think that um, there are things like that, that happen um, when you, I don't know, when, when you're young that sort of stay with you, and this was one of those for me, and I kind of knew then that one day I would have to write something about that. But it got more interesting, because I, I began to see that the Camondo story, this, this, um, this major bequest of a collection to a country that then turned against the family and, and the whole community, was not an isolated case. So the Camondos were intermarried and were kind of interconnected with a number of other families, prominent French Jewish families, who had done the same, who had left either an art collection, a house, something to France as a means of kind of glorifying its patrimony and trying to sort of advance it from within. And I think also in a time of heightened anti-Semitism, which we'll talk more about in a minute, showing that Jews had as much of a right to uh, be French and could sort of access the, the kind of cultural heritage as much as anybody else. And so there's a sort of ulterior motive there as well that's very moving. Um, and you know, in doing the book, I what I really tried to do, I mean, so it's this kind of bigger story about um, belonging and betrayal in a very fraught moment, but I was really interested in the individual people because so many of these families are hugely important um, in the hi in history of modern France, but also modern Europe. And it's really jarring today that they're essentially forgotten and that very little remains of them and nobody really seems to care. And so one of the projects of the book is to sort of restore their stories and their subjectivities and their particularities as much as possible and to kind of make them come alive as best we can with the traces that survive. And I spent years in various archives and tracking down um, anyone who may have been connected or a kind of descendant many times removed, there aren't that many left, um, to sort of find everything that we can, we, that we can say. And that's the book. It's, um, it's meant to be a kind of, um, um, you know, a, uh, 
some, somewhat of a love letter to this remarkable community of men and women who built so much and who were very brave and who tried to, above all else, build something beautiful as the world collapsed around them. And so with that, I'm gonna begin my presentation, which is on one kind of important story from the book. It's about a particularly dramatic uh, Renoir portrait um, that sort of unites the various um, stories in the book and takes us all the way through um, the end of the war. So with that, I will get going. And I think, okay. Oh, <laughs> we're okay. All right. So this is an image that I imagine um, many of you will recognize. Um, it's a portrait that you know these days appears on tote bags, refrigerator magnets, coffee mugs, and museum gift shops around the world. But it has a particularly important history and a very specific Jewish past, which is less known. So this is a portrait by Renoir, the great 19th century artist, of a young woman, or at, at, uh, at this point, I think a, maybe about six or seven year old girl, whose name was Irene Cayenne d'Anvers. And the Cayenne d'Anvers, who we'll talk more about in a minute, are one of the families in the book. But um, they were a very cosmopolitan and very wealthy French Jewish banking family in this period. And very much, um, the, this is the world of Proust that we're talking about. Or for those of you who have read The Hair with Amber Eyes, this is very much, um, that same world. So the, the mother of this young woman was a patron of Renoir's, um, was a, a great salonier, you know, hosting kind of glittering dinners and, and salons, you know, with the leading writers and thinkers of the day. And they hired, the Candelver hired um, Renoir to paint portraits of their daughters. And it, it, um, it's important to point out that Renoir himself in the era of the Dreyfus Affair, the, the portrait's done in 1881, just um, in advance of the, of the affair, but Renoir himself was deeply, deeply anti-Semitic, um, deeply critical of the Cayenne family, but also um, he never was paid higher um, by any of his other patrons for a portrait than this one, so go figure. Um, this is the real life, um, and, and so, Really, what I'm going to talk to you about is the story of this one, um, th this one portrait, but also of the the woman behind it, who is a kind of enigma that um, I was fascinated by. So this is the real um, uh, young woman in the portrait, and I like th this is a photo from the French National Archives that I found, and I like it because it shows us the same subject in the same profile. So you get a sense of um, the actual person, um, which we know very little about. Um, the portrait by Renoir was a huge critical success. Um, it was heralded by the art critics of the day. This is an etching from the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, which is sort of the equivalent of the Burlington Magazine or Apollo kind of leading art critical journal of its time. Um, that journal, um, interestingly enough, edited by Charles Effroussi, another great uh, French Jewish esthete and the kind of main character in um, The Hair with Amber Eyes, again. Um, it, it had a lot of, um, it was at the 1881 Salon, it had a lot of kind of critical success, but interestingly enough, the Cayenne d'Anver family really didn't like the portrait very much, and it always hung sort of in the maid's quarters of their house. Um, so we don't know exactly what was wrong with it. I think it's entirely lovely, but you know, um, there's no accounting for taste, as they say. These are portraits of Mr. and Mrs. Cayenne d'Anvers, Louise and Louis Cayenne d'Anvers. Um, the, the wife, as I mentioned, was the great salonier. The husband, one of the founders of the bank that through various transformations became one of the precursors of Paribas, which is still around today. So this is truly you know, the, the epitome of the financial elite. And in later years, because of that, um, that role that the family played in high finance, they became major targets of anti-Semitism, and we'll talk about that in a second. So as I mentioned, you know, this is, this is the world of Proust, and Proust, interestingly enough, was a very close friend of the Cayenne d'Anvers, a confidant of Mrs. Cayenne d'Anvers. Um, so when you read In Search of Lost Time, um, whose protagonist, by the way, I should point out, is a Jewish collector, so that kind of, that persona is in many ways a sort of central figure of 
the, the story of that time. You know, Proust, these, the, 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 the families in the book, the Candelver and others, are the actual real life inspirations for so much in the novel, which is another reason why I was really fascinated to, to do this research. Um, but it's really that kind of glittering Paris on the brink of collapse that we are in, and the portrait is a sort of um, cultural embodiment of that time. So um, on the collections and what um, all of it means on a material level. So this, um, I should say that the Candelver were among a network of Jewish families, all of whom collected um, 18th century art and objets d'art at that time. Now, why was that? This is their house at, or I should say chateau at Champs-sur-Marne outside Paris, about an hour to the east. Um, it's, it's important, there are several things to, to point out about this. Um, the first is that what they did was purchase a chateau with an illustrious history. So this is a, this is a, um, a house that had borne witness in its time to um, uh, Madame de Pompadour, one of the mistresses of, of, of the French king, um, Chateaubriand and Voltaire. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a site of French history where so many illustrious characters had come. And instead of building something new, you know, they, they bought this house with a pre-existing history, restored it to its former glory, I think as a means of showing that Jews could be loyal custodians of the French past, um, curators of this sort of national um, identity and image that they had as much of a right to to be in as did anyone else. And why the 18th century style, especially in a time when um, there were other Jews, especially sort of um, on the dealing side, so invested in modernism and, you know, like, um, that's a whole other topic, very interesting as well. But the 18th century style is crucial in understanding this milieu because it's essentially about so the, the 18th century was the high watermark of French cultural genius, or it was seen as such at the time. It was the most prestigious style you could have. And so for, um, I should also say that in the late 19th century for the first time, many of the kind of um, uh, very coveted um, art objects that for years and for centuries even had been the um, exclusive province of nobility were for sale on a new art market that, um, uh, wealthy elites who did not necessarily have noble background could purchase. And so that was true for many um, collectors uh, who did not have that background, Jews or non-Jews for that matter. There were many in the age of high finance and industry, there were many newly minted fortunes made like the Candelver, but also others. Um, and that's true not just in France. I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen the show Gilded Age where one of the characters builds that huge mansion on Fifth Avenue and then kind of designs it with this outlandish French style. And that's very much what we're seeing here. It's a means of purchasing prestige and patrimony and positioning yourself as somebody who really belongs among these objects and their histories. And so it's very much that, that story. Um, but then it comes with a particular, um, it, there's a particular, um, I think, meaning for many of these Jewish collectors. And I'm showing you here a photo of truly one of the most abhorrent people um, uh, to have ever lived in France and modern Europe. This is Edouard Drummond, one of the leading anti-Semites of his day. Um, and the reason that I bring him up at all is that um, it's so, so important. I mean, I, one of the things I try to argue in the book is that, um, you know, in the long and kind of constant history of anti-Semitism, it's important that we recognize that there are distinct, that there are different and distinct chapters. So the hatred has the same objective, but it has different terms in different moments. And it, it has different sort of origins and different reference points in different times and places. And in the moment that I was writing about, the other thing that's so important to realize is that um, so much of the virulent and inescapable anti-Semitic rhetoric in France at the turn of the century was material or aesthetic in, in nature. And what I mean by that is that 
the likes of Drummond, who had an anti-Semitic newspaper that you know sold hundreds of thousands of copies, who wrote one of the best-selling anti-Semitic tracts of all time, La France Juive, or Jewish France, which, by the way, made the fortunes of the publishing house Flammarion, which is still around today. Um, you know, the way that he attacked Jews and so many of the other followers that he had, the way that they attacked Jews, the, the actual language that they used was art, objects, and things. So Drummond attacked the Rothschilds, for instance, not because, well, I mean, absolutely because, but not th through the fact that they were originally from Germany, but because they had bought this, this, this um, mansion, Ferriere, outside Paris, which in his mind was a properly French site that they had no business owning because they were Jews. So the Jewish invasion or Jewish menace in his mind was a sort of material menace. And that is why, so, what I'm, I think what I'm saying um, is that on the one hand, if the language of anti-Semitism was material, for Jewish collectors, collecting art, objects, all of that, the whole aesthetic universe was an essential part of their response. So these collections have that element of them too. They're proud statements that know we belong, we are just as French as you, and look how well we can do it. And some of the collections are superb to that effect. Um, this is another portrait that Renoir did of the Cayenne d'Anvers daughters, um, Alice and Elizabeth. Um, Alice is the one in pink, Elizabeth Cayenne d'Anvers is the one in blue, and we'll come back to this in a little bit, but Elizabeth Cayenne d'Anvers, the, the young girl in blue, is later um, deported and murdered in Auschwitz when she's an old woman in her mid-60s. Um, so, this is... Um, a portrait of, uh, so I should say, I realize um, it's quite a Byzantine story with lots of names and characters, so um, I, I apologize for that, but I'll try and make it as clear as possible. The young woman in the portrait that you saw at the beginning eventually is sort of forced to marry this man, whose name is Moise de Camondo. He is the one who collected the um, amazing collection that's in the Camondo Museum. It's his family's namesake. The Camondo and the Cayenne d'Anvers, um, he was also a business partner of Irene's father, so another banking family, although um, very different in terms of relationship to, Jewish, to Jewishness, Judaism, and just sort of France in general. So the, the Cayenne d'Anvers are the most sort of Parisian and sort of assimilated kind of um, Jewish family that you can find at the time. The Camondo are different. The Camondo are from Constantinople. They are Sephardic. They are um, very, very religiously observant, where the K and Donver really are not. Um, and they're, interestingly, you know, Moise de Camondo was not born in France, whereas Irene was, and there's this very, kind of um, difference in perspective between them. And also, when they were married, he was 32 and she was 19, so quite a, quite a difference. And it's not clear that anyone had ever asked her what she wanted to do with her life, but it didn't work that way at the time. She's forced to marry uh, Moise de Camondo, and they have a very, very unhappy marriage that sort of collapses from the start. Um, this is, just to kind of continue along the theme of the sort of high 18th century watermark, this is the Musée Camondo in Paris, which I think is in many ways the most exquisite of all the collections. Um, but, you know, for all that I was just explaining about what collection is in terms of a response to anti-Semitism for Jewish collectors, it's also important to realize, and I think that this is something we can all relate to, is that their collecting is, is both social but also psychological. So whatever it is about showing to the outside world, whatever kind of point you're trying to make, it's also deeply, deeply personal. And it's about what, I mean, people's relationships to objects you know, surpass their relationships to texts. They're sort of unknowable. We don't really know exactly why a particular clock or painting or whatever speaks to another person or even indeed to ourselves. And I also think it's important to realize that collection, it's, it's a means of control, of simulating a, I mean, there's an amazing essay by Walter Benjamin on um, collection where he talks about the collection as a magic circle, so against dispersion and chaos. So collection is the kind of last stand against the abyss. You can order the objects in a room and in your house in a way that you cannot order the people and events in your life. And I think that that's very, very important in understanding these families as well 
in a moment of heightened and terrible anti-Semitism that they could never escape. And this is very, very much the case for Moïse de Camondo, who was deeply, deeply controlling and sought to organize um, the people in his life as he did his objects, including his wife and especially the women in his family. And Irene Candelver revolted against that. So this is a portrait also from the, um, this is a very kindly shared with me by one of the great granddaughters of Iran who's still around. Um, she eventually causes a huge scandal in this sort of uh, bourgeois Jewish society by running off with the non-Jewish stable master of the Camondo estate, an Italian, um, and she leaves Moise de Camondo behind, leaves her family behind, is sort of momentarily excommunicated, and then has um, another child with her new husband. So what you're looking at here is a portrait of Irene um, who's who looks rather unhappy in this photo as well, with um, her two older Camondo children, um, uh, Nisim de Camondo, the, the young man on the right, Beatrice de Camondo, the older girl on the left, and then her youngest daughter, Claude Sampieri, um, the toddler in the, in the front. And so it's a sort of story of familial fracture and scandal, and it was all over the papers in Paris at the time. But you get the sense, um, you know, this is one of the both interesting and frustrating things about doing this kind of research um, that's like micro-historical and non-specific characters. At some point, there's just a wall and we don't know what is really going through someone's mind. So the best you can do is kind of fill in the, the, the gaps and make an educated guess. But, you know, for, somebody, for, for, for a woman in that time, you know, I do have a lot of sympathy for Irene at this juncture, trying to eke out a life of her own design, um, away from especially the sort of male influences in her life who had always kind of forced her into boxes. But it gets more complicated, and we'll talk about that in a second. This is her son, Nisim de Camondo, who dies fighting for France in the First World War. And that's a really important part of the book because I show that in many of the families, someone died fighting for France. So there was this huge um, Jewish investment in the Republic defending it um, from its enemies. And um, you know, there, there is this uh, phrase by the historian Philippe Landau that the First World War was the what he calls the apogee of the Israelite, meaning the, the kind of, the, the highest point of achievement for, for the French Jewish establishment in that time, really invested in defending the country and feeling fully French and proud to die for the country that had, um, had given them so much. Because of course, France was the first country to emancipate its Jewish population in the French Revolution, which I think many of these families felt deeply grateful for. So back to um, the, in, the enigmatic Irene K. and Denver, the Renoir subject. So this is her with her second husband in the 1930s. Um, yeah, we, we, there are very few traces. This is, again, a photograph that comes from her great-granddaughter from family albums. Um, at this point, you know, her relationship with her own children is difficult to suss out. Beatrice de Camondo, who is kind of a main character in my book, she is the, the, the Camondo child who's murdered in Auschwitz, is just in the back in the corner. Um, so we have the sense that um, Irene was still somewhat present in their lives, but we don't really know. And it seems from the records that do survive that she was quite estranged from her first two children. Um, and again, though, there, there are sort of question marks there, so I, I can't really say, but it, there, there is this kind of bizarre, strange family unit that emerges, and especially a very fraught relationship between mother and daughter. So um, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, Okay, so this is um, Beatrice de Camondo and her husband, Leon Reinach. Again, I'm sorry for the abundance of names, especially for the fact that so many of them are called, in fact, Leon and Beatrice. But this is um, uh, Irene and Irene Candelver, the Renoir portrait's daughter, and her daughter with Moise de Camondo. And then her husband, Leon Reinach, um, the scion of one of the most important French Jewish families in history, the Reinachs. Um, and it really does break my heart that they have absolutely vanished from the record, essentially. Um, they were the equivalent of, I mean, it's impossible to say. I mean, they were in the parliament. They were the governors of, of, of the Louvre Museum at one point. They were hugely influential academics, journalists, scholars. It would be like 
um, the James family in the late 19th century in the US being totally forgotten, but that's how crucial and how central they were to the cultural life of France before the war. And now they are totally gone. And um, you know, in the process of, of correcting the manuscript, as a PhD student, when I first started working on this, the Reinach house outside Paris had a little, what used to be the house, I should say, had a, um, uh, a, a kind of plaque that used to come, I mean, it was faded, but a, at least something with their name and saying what they had done. And then at some point in the course of some kind of renovation ordered by City Hall, it was taken down. And when I kind of called just to check to see if, um, like what the deal with that was and whether it would be up again soon, I was told by the City Hall officials that there was no plan to put it back. So it kind of tells you everything about this entire story. Um, anyway, Leon and Beatrice are married after the First World War. They live in splendor in um, a huge apartment in neuilly sur seine which looks right out onto the, the Bois de Boulogne. Um, and today it looks right out onto the, um, the museum that's the, the Fondation Louis Vuitton, for those of you who have who've been. Um, and it's um, one of the weirdest sort of research experiences that I had. Um, I found the um, address and sort of asked around um, with the kind of each building like this has a kind of um, concierge or, or guardian. And um, she took my number. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a call from this Israeli family that has, that, that are the current occupants of the apartment owned by Beatrice de Camondo and her husband. And it's totally different and it's gone through renovations, but I, I was able to go inside and sort of see the view from the windows. And it's just a sort of surreal um, research experience to see sort of the views that the people that you were writing about once saw. Um, anyway, so they, um, they were the ones that kept the Renoir portrait in their apartment in Neuilly because it was not a, a cherished artifact of her grandparents who had commissioned it, and it was a wedding present, and it hung in their living room in a sort of place of pride. Um, it's another complicated marriage that does not work out, and I write about this a lot in the book, another kind of challenge of microhistory you just don't know. Um, they got divorced actually in October of 1942, which is bizarre because that's months after, well, it's years into the Nazi occupation of France. It is months after the infamous roundup of Parisian Jews in July 1942. And, you know, I am not sure what, what was the, the rationale behind it at that point, like how, um, you know, we, we just don't know what was, what was on her mind and why that seemed sort of so important. The divorce certificate says it was because of her husband's infidelities, but um, one of the things I also discovered in the course of research was that Beatrice had become a sort of impassioned Catholic convert and had um, in some ways, I think, tried to force her own children to join the church as well. And for someone like Leon Reinach, that may very well have been unacceptable. So I'm not, I, it's very complicated and we don't really know, um, as you really never do with another person indeed. But um, they are important because it is a kind of microcosmic representation of a whole sort of Jewish society at the time of the Nazi invasion, in which the Jews, such as the Reinachs, Camondos, Caen d'Anvers, the Rothschilds, the list goes on, they rightly felt that they had given so much to France. You know, their sons had died fighting in its armies. They had already donated before the Second World War these amazing collections to sort of burnish the glory of the, the cultural patrimony of the nation. And so the arrival of the Nazis, they didn't necessarily understand that they would not be seen as French and protected as such, and that they would be boxed in to this um, identity category of a Jew in a way that they didn't necessarily um, even conceive of. And it's heartbreaking to, to read the correspondence from that time and to see these illusions sort of persist up into a point until they don't. And one of the most heartbreaking letters that I found is a letter written by Leon Reinach um, to the, the authorities in late 1941, so a year into the occupation, asking sort of, you know, when, um, 
they would stop being harassed and when they would get some of their stolen property back. Because, and he goes through the list of everything that everyone in his family on both his wife's side and his own side had given to the state. And his own father had left this amazing villa in the south of France. It's a museum you can visit today. The Camondo Museum was donated in the mid-30s. The list goes on and you know, he never got a response. And you, you just, you, um, it's impossible to imagine what it would have felt for someone like that to be treated that way. But that's, that's um, it's, it's a story of shattered illusions. Um, to return, so the Nazis arrive and part and parcel with the attempt to liquidate the Jewish people was an attempt to liquidate Jewish collections and Jewish material culture, as we all know, and there's been a lot written on that. This is a photo of the ERR. Um, my German is not very good, so I'm not gonna pronounce the whole thing, but the sort of Nazi art task force um, kind of going through the Louvre. But um, the French had sort of thought a little bit in advance, and so had many Jewish collectors, including the Camondo Rhinox. So this is a photo of Jacques Jojard um, on the left. He was the director of kind of the French Museum Council at the time, and he really deserves a lot of credit for saving so many of the priceless objects from France's important museums, transporting them to the Chateau Chambord early before the Nazis arrived in France. And eventually they would, they would loot much of that, but um, it's thanks to Jojard that a lot of it does survive. Now, the, um, it's um, probably a little small for some of you to see, but the photo on the, the, um, the right-hand side of the screen is of some of the uh, storerooms of the chateau where a lot of the art from the museums, but also from Jewish collections was kept. And Leon Reinach had written to Jojard to um, kind of safe keep a lot of the family's collection, including the Renoir portrait. So we know that it was in this room in 1941, and it was there that the Nazis eventually stole the portrait of Irene K. Um, this is Irene's sister, the other subject of a Renoir portrait, who was, this is Elizabeth K. who I mentioned. Um, this is a photo from family albums of her in hiding in the Loire Valley in 1943 before she was arrested and ultimately killed in Auschwitz. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. So the, the portrait of, um, the fate of the portrait of Iran is fascinating because we don't know exactly what happens to it at every juncture. We do know the following, which is that eventually it ends up in the personal collection of Hermann Goering, Hitler's right-hand man, which is just really, I mean, it's, it, it makes your sort of your skin crawl to think about that. But, um, it, it, it was widely seen as beautiful because it is indeed a, a beautiful portrait and he really saw something in it. He took it, um, eventually he traded it for something else. We think a Florentine Tondo, but we're not exactly sure. Um, but the painting is recovered by the Allies eventually and um, then um, what happens gets really, really strange and confusing. But first, I want to return and, um, and to speak a little bit about Beatrice de Camondo. Um, and you know, she and one of, is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I was just absolutely heartbroken by her story from the beginning. Um, she is seemingly incapable of realizing the real danger that she is in and that her children are in, and she refuses to leave France despite the fact that she has these amazing means and resources at her disposal. Um, she stays put. She seemed, I, I, can't, I couldn't really figure out what the mindset was. I think it's partly what I was saying that, you know, she really believed that she and her family and her milieu had done so much for the country and that, you know, they weren't in danger. I also think it's partly, um, perhaps the tendency of the very wealthy and very elite to think that bad things can't happen to rich people. Um, she seems to think that she would be protected somehow, but it just, it didn't happen. Um, and I, there's very, very little traces that survive of her. We know that she was arrested on the night of December 5th, 1942, in the apartment that I visited and that she was deported, or sorry, first interned in Drancy, the uh, kind of holding detainment camp outside Paris, which is today a stop on the commuter rail to the airport, um, for those of you who have been on that train. It, um, and it was there that 
I mean, she was, she arrived in December 1942 and is there for a really long time until March 1944, which is rare. And th that she lasted so long in Drancy and sort of avoided deportation for that amount of time is quite mysterious, and we don't really know what happened. She was on the kind of count, the, the camp council where she was in charge of kind of infant nursery in, the, in, in Drancy. And from all the accounts, I was able to find, um, she, there, there are no writings of hers that survived, but I was able to find recollections of others that remembered her. And she was remembered as somebody with kind of the utmost amount of class until the end, who really sort of threw herself into cooking and cleaning. And for somebody from her background, that was quite a, a shock, because she had something like you know, 40 servants beforehand. But she was really seen to be a kind of matriarch of the camp and beloved. Um, eventually, her children and ex-husband are deported before she is, um, and she herself is not deported until March of 1944. And she is sent to Auschwitz, where she also lasts a remarkably long time, given the horrible conditions. And she is killed in January of 1945, just two weeks, two weeks before the camp was liberated. And we don't know exactly how she died, because at that time, um, the gas chambers were no longer in use, given the sort of flight from the approaching Soviets. And um, she might have died on a, on a death march, most likely, but we don't know exactly. But with, with her, this whole world sort of is liquidated, and it's, and it's sort of definitively gone. Um, so as I mentioned, there's very little of her that survives. And one of the things that I tried to do was find as much of her voice and bring it back as, as best we can. Um, and perhaps the most sort of serendipitous thing that happened in the research was coming across an old man whose mother, um, uh, uh, from a Jewish family, I should say, whose mother had been a friend of Beatrice de Camondo in childhood. And they had, Beatrice was an impassioned equestrian, and she had a kind of country estate next to this man's mother's family. And so they were childhood friends, et cetera, in the country. And he had, um, it, just, it, it was just an amazing moment because you know, I, I went to him and I had to kind of prove my chops as a, as a researcher and kind of pass various tests. And then in his apartment, which is a small apartment in Neuilly, not particularly glamorous, just um, kind of full of tchotchkes, et cetera, he had a slant top desk and then he opened it up and then inside were two letters that Beatrice had written his mother. One in 1917 um, during the First World War, and I'm sure there had been others, but these are the ones that had survived and that he had kept. And the second um, is this document right here which was written in September of 1942, three months to the day before her arrest by the Gestapo. And it's a fascinating testament because, you know, she really, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to see it from this far away, but there's a line in here that says, you know, I really believe that God and the Virgin will protect me and save us all. And she really does seem to have believed that. And it just breaks your heart, um, but, I don't know, I mean, I, there, there's no sort of profound takeaway. It's just loss and devastation and, and horrible. But um, it's really amazing to see someone that you, like your subject speak in her own voice after so much time, and I just really got a lot out of that. Um, and this is my favorite photo of her because it shows, um, it, it's similarly in profile to her mother's portrait. It seems to be a theme of the women in her family. And it also, given the sort of, the, the darkness, it shows both her fate and all that we do not know about her. So the portrait has this bizarre afterlife. As I mentioned, you, know, you can find it in pretty much any museum, gift shop, or library. It appears in the famous film by Godard, Breathless, in the 60s, where it's in the background of Jean Seberg's sort of, uh, where she's pestering her boyfriend about who's prettier, me or the woman in the painting. And of course, you know, the real life Irene Can d'Anvers is still alive at that point, but no one really knows who she is or has any sense of this portrait or its particular past. So what happens to the portrait after the war? It comes back to Paris where it's exhibited in this show at the Jeux de Pomme where it was a sort of French government initiative to try and see if any survivors were around to claim some of the items that were recovered. Um, it is reclaimed by the real life Irene Candonver after, after some legal haggling because the portrait had never really belonged to her. It was her daughter's portrait and her, her daughter's husband's property. And so 
Um, given that there were no Rhinox around after the Holocaust and her daughter had died and so had her grandchildren, she does get it back. And what does she do with it? And this is the part that I find very, very difficult to swallow and hard to understand. So the picture you're seeing here is of a man named Emile Burla, who was a um, art collector, but also a, um, he was, uh, naturalized Swiss German-born arms dealer who had sold war material to the Nazis and to the Italians during the war. And you know, in Paris, in, on the black market, during the occupation, he had amassed a really amazing collection of, of works basically stolen from Jewish collections. He had many things that belonged to the famous dealer Paul Rosenberg that he was forced to give back after the war. I mean, the collection is rife with stolen work. And um, so he has that persona, and that, I would say, if you were in this sort of Jewish world in particular, you would have known that. Paul Rosenberg, the great dealer who was part of the milieu that I write about, knew right away and confronted um, Burla after the war and got his, at least many of it back, many of his pieces back. Um, so Irene Candonver, who got, the, got her own portrait back um, in 1946, she then sells it through an intermediary to Burla. So why she did that, I don't know. Um, it didn't sell for a particularly huge amount of money. Um, it sold for some, but not you know, the, the, the amount that it might have sold a little bit later. It's a huge question, but essentially what you have is a portrait that was a cherished belonging of a Holocaust victim in the collection of a Nazi collaborator who owns it legally, and now no restitution claim can be made because it is a fair and square sale by the actual subject of the painting. It's very bizarre and very strange. And, you know, it's I, one of the temptations, um, and I think pitfalls of history writing is the, the, um, the, the temptation to judge, and I tried very hard not to, but this is one thing that I really, I, I really struggle to wrap my head around because it's normal, and we, there are so many stories of the survivors getting rid of objects that reminded them of their lost loved ones. That's, that you know, is very common and well-documented. It's not particularly common that the items would be offloaded to a known Nazi collaborator. That is a big question mark. We just, I, I, I just wasn't able to answer. But the painting still is in the Burla collection today in Zurich, and you can see it there. There it is. This is the real life Iran, late in life, right before she died, again, shared with me by her great granddaughter. Um, yeah, very, very enigmatic, and so many questions that we just will never be able to know. And finally, this is the Camondo tomb in the Jewish section of the Montmartre Cemetery in Paris. And it, in a way, it was one of the last things that I visited in finishing up the book. And I'm sorry to say that it's kind of a microcosm for the whole story because this beautiful um, kind of entire little section of the cemetery of these kind of Jewish memorials have all fallen into disrepair, and the Camondo tomb is one of them. And it is, it's full of cobwebs and broken glass, and um, we can only hope that one day someone will restore it to the way it should be. And with that, um, I have finished my talk, and I'm happy to hear questions or any comments that you may have. Can everybody hear this okay? Yeah. Well, firstly, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. The book is so beautiful, beautifully written, haunting story, and uh, you know something really that, uh, as you point out, so few people really knew about these these people, and uh, remarkable for many times at just glance that I personally was really unaware of this history. But I'm going to start out by uh, by um, saying something about why I gravitated toward this book before I even knew how wonderful it was. And that's because it truly resonated to an extraordinary degree with a story in my own family. Uh, my grandfather and uh, my mother and family, as many of you know because I wrote about it and spoke about it, 
um, had uh, fled Germany in 1938 and went to France and spent four years running around France trying to uh, find refuge and ultimately escape. Um, in the course of that, they, uh, they wound up living in Lyon because that was in the uh, unoccupied zone after France fell. And uh, there my grandfather had a sister and my sister had a daughter and a family, children. And finally, after four years in 1942, my grandfather managed to get tickets on a, uh, the last ship, the last refugee ship that was leaving France before Hitler closed down the ports. And he went to his sister and the family and he said, um, I can get you on this ship, I have enough tickets, we can all escape together. And they refused to go. They were, um, they were well-to-do, they were living in Lyon, and they said to my grandfather, all very well and good, you're German, and we know that the, uh, the French Pétain, he might turn over the German Jews to the Nazis, but as a point of fact, we are pure sang, pure-blooded French, and uh, we have no reason to flee. And so they insisted on staying, and uh, as it turned out, um, a few years later, in 1943, the very next year actually, uh, there was a knock at their door one night. They were arrested by the, uh, the police, the French police, as by the way, three quarters of the 76,000 Jews who were deported from France were arrested, not by the Germans, uh, but by the French police, three quarters of them. And uh, they were among them. They were taken to the train station, their nanny, the children's nanny who had been left behind, uh, showed up at the station the next day to bring the children's coats, at which point uh, the police arrested her as well. They were also sent to Drancy, and they also wound up on the exact same convoy as the, uh, the children of, um, of uh, uh, Beatrice, right? yeah. Leon and, uh, and uh, Bertrand and Fanny, the daughters, uh, the children of Leon and Beatrice, the same convoy, number 62. Also, by the way, on that same convoy was the daughter, the granddaughter of Alfred Dreyfus, Madeleine Dreyfus Levy, the best, one of the best friends of Marshal Pétain, a man Jacques Halberner, who had been known as uh, the Marshal's Jew, also on the same convoy, uh, and uh, they died. When I went to Lyon to investigate this, you can even find in the archives there the receipts for the amount of money that they had in their pockets at the time of their arrest. So like, uh, like James, I, I went down many rabbit holes in search of history and uh, what he says about the, the people, their, their belief in their Frenchness protecting them was so extraordinary. So um, I would therefore like to start out by asking you, um, why, uh, why do you say in the book, which is so fascinating, that the, they equated Jewishness with Frenchness? And you say that there's almost a kind of Jewish ethic that they see in the very nature of being French. Well, thank you so much for that. That's an excellent question. Um, I, I think that this gets into the very kind of particularly French view of citizenship and identity, um, which we still see today a lot of in France. Um, but among this sort of very sort of well-to-do Jewish milieu, particularly, I mean, an example would be Theodore Reinach, who of all the characters in the book was the most invested in, um, I would say, sort of Jewish history, Jewish identity, and formulating a kind of symbiotic Franco-Jewish sensibility and identity. Um, he also, by the way, founded um, the antecedent of what is today the biggest liberal synagogue in France, which is still around today. I belong there. Um, it's, it's a very distinct sort of French tradition that's a little different, I think, than the way things are done here. And I mean, his, he wrote a book that I discuss in, in Fragile Things that is, um, it's called something like the, how to translate it, like the history of the Israelites from antiquity to our times. And basically what it tries to show is that um, like the French Republican tradition, the great emancipatory promise of the revolution that, you know, it inspired this kind of creed of equality and fraternity um, and liberty around the world, um, has antecedents in the wisdom of the Hebrew prophets. So for him, it was a way of situating 
um, uh, the history of the Jews as a kind of Republican prehistory. Um, which is really interesting. And um, you know, the, he follows in the footsteps of other French Jewish thinkers, and I talk about this in the book, but it's very, very I mean, unique in the sense that um, for many of these Jewish scholars in France at the time, um, you know, they, they use Republican language in talking about Jewish history. So the Israelites were the Republicans of the past. Um, God is not a king, but a Republican. I mean, it's very unique. But the idea is to show that Jewishness was the sort of republicanism of the past and its kind of most loyal steward in the present because the values of the French revolutionary and emancipatory project are very similar to the values of Judaism and Jewishness. And I mean, there's a lot of counter arguments there, of course, but that's a very distinctly French view um, that persists to this day. And so, I mean, it gets into why so many of them are so, so, so attached to the French national project, because for many of these families, they're kind of one and the same. In fact, so attached that uh, I was stunned to read that at the time when the French passed two really terrible statutes against Jews in 1940, the chief rabbi uh, of France said, uh, you know, there should be equality in France, and they did respectfully protest against these new laws that even um, allowed for the internment of foreign Jews in France. But he says, we will respond to a law of exclusion by unswerving devotion to the homeland. He writes that to Pétain, and Pétain does not even bother to answer him. So the corollary of what you're talking about there, of the, of the closeness, the symbiosis that you talk about in the book between Frenchness and Jewishness, is the other idea that you bring up about the tension between universalism and particularism, mm -hmm. that you could be have a sense of equality among the people and yet maintain your distinct identity, a struggle which we see continue even today in France with issues such as fights about headscarves. Or Absolutely. I mean, you, you've identified exactly the tension. And I think that you know, for people like Reinach and so many of these families, that is the great um, contradiction in what they say, because of course, um, you know, Jewishness is a form of particularity. It is. It is. Um, it has a whole sort of distinct and separate um, sensibility than whatever sort of national context we're talking about. And I think for Reinach and for many of these other families, they were of the view that through particularity, if done right, you could access universality. So by embracing Jewish tradition, by embracing Jewish practice and customs, you, in your own way, as a member of a particular community, could also access shared universal ideals that all other communities, including the nation, also shared. And it's, it's, a, it's a fragile interpretation, and I think flawed in some aspects, but it's, it's, again, a very, very French way of looking at this. And I think you're absolutely right to talk about the parallels today, where the question is much more, um, and I say this on the day of the final round of the French presidential election, when both the issue of Holocaust denial as ever, anti-Semitism, but also um, what to, you know, the question of Islam in public life in France is super, super intense, as, as always, and it is the same discussion. So the characters in the book are in many ways formulating um, an answer to that same question that's being asked today, absolutely. Uh, before we move on, uh, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, Rabbi Shankman has an extra microphone, and she'll be happy to bring it around if you just raise your hand. Um, and. Rabbi, there are two hands raised, three hands raised. Well, I just want to uh, let the audience know that this, your book, besides being reviewed in book reviews, was also uh, reviewed in Art New, or Art in America, excuse me. Was so I was uh, very pleased to see that. I'd read the book a while ago, and so, uh, it's sort of in the uh, art world as well as the uh, literature world. I thought that was a great compliment. And just wanted to make that point. Yeah, thank you. I was, I was delighted by all that. Hi. Um, I know that the Rothschilds and the Yafruzis, there was a marriage there. 
um, that was not very happy, mm -hmm. but I've been to their house in the Cote d'Azur. Um, were the Rothschilds all converted by World War II? What happened to the French Rothschilds? Uh, no, they, they, were, they were not converted. They were still, um, still Jewish, and um, the Rothschilds of the milieu that is considered in the book, and there's a chapter on that house in the book, the, the yeah. FRC Rothschild Mansion. Right, right. Yeah. Um, they were the only ones that really left France um, during the war, and so they um, survive, and they are still around to this day, um, largely because of that. So, um, I mean, they went some to London, um, some to New York, and then eventually back uh, in France after the war. And so, you know, one of the, like, they've been very involved in Jewish life in France ever since. Um, you know, Fran France is a very sort of um, centralized country in all things. And so there's a central, um, uh, there's a, what's called the consistoire, the kind of central Jewish organization, but then also for civic associations, there's a separate one. Um, they were the presidents of that for many, many years. And, and very um, invested in the whole project, so um, and not, not converted. Okay, thank you. Please clarify something for me. Did I understand from reading the book, which I thoroughly enjoyed, um, that Beatrice was the daughter of Irene? Yes. Is that correct? That's right. And that Irene could have been more helpful with the situation of Beatrice being deported. Did I understand that correctly? That's correct. Um, I mean, it's another one of the um, questions in uh, the research, especially on these kind of very specific individuals where you really are bound by the paper trail. So um, what we do know is on the German side, they were extremely meticulous about record keeping and documentation and um, all of that. So on that side, we have a transcript of a, of a conversation that happened in the Paris police pre prefecture where Irene goes at one point to try and save her sister Elizabeth, who um, I showed you pictures of, the one from the second portrait who was kind of sickly and then um, uh, arrested in hiding in the Loire Valley. And so Irene somehow gets word of that, goes and tries to save her sister by whatever means. It's also quite interesting that as somebody with exactly the same background, um, a Jewish woman, um, although you know she had an Italian husband at that time, um, not that that made a difference, she felt comfortable going right into the Gestapo headquarters, revealing herself as a relation of somebody who was literally on her way to Auschwitz at that time and didn't feel particularly in jeopardy. So that raises questions about whether she had a protector or I, I, we don't know. But anyway, she did that for her sister. There is no similar record that she ever did the same for her daughter or for her grandchildren. And we don't, um, it's possible that it didn't survive, that that one document might have been destroyed or might not have been kept, who knows. But it's pretty, I think, telling that there's the one and not the other, especially given how thorough um, the authorities were on keeping those documents. Was there any feeling about Beatrice having converted to Catholicism and Irene, did she, Irene, maintain her Judaism? Irene did not maintain her Judaism. She okay. also had converted, um, and that she did that when she married her second husband, the Italian Catholic stable man. Yeah. You know, the serendipity of who was arrested and who was not um, was sometimes very hard to figure out. And in fact, in the case that I started off telling you about, I went back to the building where these cousins of mine had been deported. Uh, the wife and three little children and the governess uh, in 1943. And I found um, an elderly man living there who had been there on the night that they were arrested. And he described looking through the people and watching the whole thing. And, and he said to me, you know, it was very strange because there were an, quite a number of other Jewish families living in this building at the same time. And none of them were arrested, but your cousins were. And uh, when I finally pressed him, well, why, why they? Why were they arrested? 
he kind of embarrassedly sort of looked down at the floor and kind of shuffled his feet. And he said, well, you know, the thing was, it was a time of such privation and nobody had any food, but uh, they were very wealthy. And everyone in the building could smell these tantalizing odors coming from their apartment of the good food that they were cooking, that they were buying on the black market. And this engendered so much hostility that um, some of the neighbors, it's thought, denounced them to the police, and so they were arrested. So there were so many, you know, uh, strange, you know, uh, things that could determine one's fate during that period. I think, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Um, you know, one thing we haven't touched on that much, and, and you, you go into it in the book uh, ex extremely well, is the impact of the Dreyfus affair. Yes. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, the Dreyfus affair is, the, I would argue, maybe the key plot point of the Third Republic, which was the government in France between 1870 and 1940, the, the arrival of the Germans. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the details, but if not, um, Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish military captain in the French army, wrongfully accused of treason um, and spying for the Germans. Um, it was a convenient target, both because he was Jewish, but also because he um, was from Alsace and with a kind of German sounding name. And so there was this whole conspiracy where he was framed, um, wrongfully convicted, sent for 12 years of imprisonment on Devil's Island off the coast of South America. But then aside from that, it was this amazing uh, tidal wave, really, of anti-Semitism that comes out. It's the sort of fruition of many things. It's the sort of age-old Catholic anti-Semitism. It's also in the age, the, the, the new age of finance capitalism and, and industrial power, uh, you know, the, the, the rhetoric about Jewish um, control of industry and finance, the age-old thing. Um, all of, and, and, and also the occult and superstition and irrationality all at once. And it really, it was an amazingly polarizing moment that in some ways foretells the polarization that you know, has, has returned in so many ways to, to our societies today in which you have people that live in completely alternate realities, even across some of the same tables and same families. And it, it was a moment from which France never recovered. And it's this sort of the anti-Dreyfusard, Dreyfusard debate is one that's constantly being um, rethought. Um, and it, you see it, I mean, in many ways, I mean, you could see the candidacy of Marine Le Pen as the anti-Dreyfusard camp, and it, it is back. And not, not that it ever went away, but it, it is, it's sort of always there, and it metastasizes, and it grows, and it's still with us even now. And I think, What's important to know about the Dreyfus affair for the characters in the book is that in that moment, um, they, you know, they were the sort of personal targets of the likes of Edouard Drummond, who we talked about, and, and many others. You know, they were harassed in newspapers by name. There were books written about them. I mean, that really kind of hounded. And you kind of, it's difficult to imagine what that must have felt like um, to, to be the sort of you know, item of public censure every day. Um, and I think it, in many ways, wounded them, and it, um, you, in their private correspondence, you get a lot of the, the vulnerability that they never showed the public, and I try to draw some of that out in the book. But I mean, it's, it's a huge moment that I think also um, informs their desire to donate so many of their collections to France after the, or after the affair in the 20s and 30s to show that, you know, you have all said that we are foreign, that we are not to be trusted, that we're Jews, and now you know we will donate everything we have to the state because we love France and we are proud to be French. And we know how that ended, but at the time, you know, I think they thought that that would be a real way of cultivating for themselves a sense of belonging. And I think you even point out in the book that uh, Dreyfus himself was so forgiven that uh, yes. after he was exonerated, he went back into the military where he remained until he was in his 50s. Absolutely, and by the way, his rank was never fully reinstated, yeah. so totally humiliated, and then he serves again in World War I. You know, the group sponsoring today, the Empty Nesters, took us on a um, field trip to Annapolis, the, Mil the academy, mm -hmm. a few years ago, and they have a permanent exhibit all about the Dreyfus affair, right in sort of the entrance lobby. So that's very interesting, Annapolis is quite close to us. 
Something you mentioned in the book that also I just thought we should mention for everyone who's here that brings us really close to home is, is but you didn't mention in your lecture, is that one of the main characters, Charles of Fousey, is in the is in the boating party portrait. Uh, yes, that's uh, right. At the Phillips collection. At, at the Phillips Gallery, which yeah. is at Dupont Circle. Right. Now Absolutely. I spent my junior year on the edge, living with a family on the edge of the Park Monceau. Ah. And I did not hear anything about the fact that Avenue Monceau was uh, so important. I, I call it now the, the sort of Jewish Potomac mm -hmm. of that period. <laughs> I didn't know it was a Jewish neighborhood at the time. And so one of my questions is, I wonder why I didn't know about that. I was there in 1960, 61. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the Commando Museum was not open at the time. A friend of mine who, make notes, because I've got about three questions. Oh, okay. my, a good friend who lives nearby here, but I don't see her here today, told me about this whole story some years ago. And I read The, um, the Hair with the Amber Eyes. And I, vis I made it my business a few years ago to go visit the museum, which I had not mm. seen while I was a junior abroad student. An ultimate question I have for you, because I gather you live in France, is what do you think of the future of, of uh, life for Jews in France mm -hmm. in the future? Um, well, thank you for all of those. Those are big questions. Um, but I'll, I'll start with the, the little aftermath of the museum first. Um, so the Camelot Museum was open when you were a student there in the 60s. It absolutely was. Um, there would not have been a, um, so today if you go to the museum, you kind of come into the Porte Cachere, there's a plaque you know, that was put up when it opened in the 30s that says, you know, this is the, the gift of Moise de Camondo in honor of his fallen son, Nisim, you know, who died fighting for France in the First World War, and you know, we're so honored to leave the collection to the state, blah, 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 blah. Um, in the 80s, so about 20 years after you were around, there is a small addendum sort of tacked on underneath, which adds as a point of clarification that Beatrice de Camondo and the grandchildren and the ex-husband were all murdered in Auschwitz. Um, so that's there now. Um, and I should say that the museum um, where I worked extensively in the archives they do a great job of bringing more of the family story into the collection now. And that's changed even from when I was a child and first saw it. I mean, they, they really now, I think, um, given the rising interest in this topic just in general, they realize that, you know, that is of great interest to the visitors that they get, much more so than the art actually is. And so now, the sort of, it's, it's funny because it's, it's multiple things at once. It's an art museum, it's, it's a decorative arts masterpiece, but it's also a sort of Jewish memorial in many ways. And now the upstairs, the sort of private apartments where you have the traces of the individuals are equally as important, I think, than the, the amazing, like Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun paintings and all that. Um, the other thing is that, that that sort of fits into, like when you were a student in France, there was still a lot of silence about French complicity in the Holocaust, and that did not really kind of emerge until at the very earliest, the late 60s and early 70s, and then eventually becomes a major sort of talking point in the 1980s, and only in 1995 does President Jacques Chirac formally apologize for um, the, the Veldiv, the roundup of Parisian Jews in 1942. So it was a, a hard fought battle that took years and even decades to, um, to establish. The, I mean, a, a French acknowledgement and indeed sort of Holocaust memory in general. And when you were there, it was just, it was not really something that people talked about, as you, as you said. So I mean, that, that fits with the sort of general mood of the time. Um, as for the question of um, Jewish life in France today, I mean, I, I hardly feel qualified to speak on that. I'm, a, after all, a visiting American from Dallas, alas. Um, so hardly an expert on that. Um, but, you know, I can tell you that, um, I can tell you that, for instance, in the, the synagogue that I belong to, which is the, the, the one that, or I, I, that I have, I, I'm, you know, I'm not French, I'm not gonna live there forever and ever, but the one that I have attended and belong to while living there is the one founded by Theodore Reinach, the kind of the, the character in the book. Um, it's 
Jewish life in France today, I think, you know, there is this, the, the, on the one hand, you know, we, we absolutely have to be honest that there is this sort of horrible um, uh, recurrence of anti-Semitic violence. Um, today, different from the book, that's important to, to note. Um, so the French state does do a lot with Holocaust education, with, um, uh, you know, protection of Jewish communities, et cetera, is very responsive to that. But the anti-Semitic violence you see in France today, um, the various sort of synagogue shootings that have happened or at the, the kosher supermarket outside Paris, it's a slightly different thing because it comes from predominantly the kind of North African um, immigrant communities. Um, it's a slightly different discourse, but it's very present and it is a problem. Um, on the other hand, I, have been very impressed by the richness and diversity of French Jewish life and how vibrant it is. And I think that there's been a lot of work in recent years to, um, you know, expand, especially in you know reform synagogues like the the one that that I have had the privilege of of, of belonging to, to um, really rebuild um, a Jewish life in a country where for so long there hasn't been a. a a large amount of institutional Jewish life, even though France has Europe's largest Jewish population, even today. So it's been very, I mean, inspiring. And there's a lot of sort of Jewish intellectual culture that's been um, supported and encouraged in recent years. So I mean, I, I know that the image from afar often looks dark, and it's, it's always a question that I get when I visit home in the US. But actually, on the ground, it is both concerning, but also inspiring in other ways. So um, I, it's a complicated one, but thank you for asking that question. Just a quick point. Uh, I had a, fr a French cousin from Strasbourg who came here a couple of years ago, and she was astonished when she came to uh, the States that we don't have to um, go through metal detectors coming into uh, our synagogue. Is that very prevalent uh, in Europe? Now? Yeah, it's, it's very prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. So question. Uh, uh, in, in the deep dive in the archives that you've gone through to develop this very rich portrait of what you've just described, what kind of strikes me, and I wondered if you got any more insight into it, is the psychology of, of, of the Jews through this period that you described in a sense that it seems like, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'll use the word, that folks were Share, we're sharing uh, kind of a, uh, a, a group delusion about their safety and, and about the fact that they had been such contributors to the culture of France and, you know, been part of the war and so on and so forth. And um, that, but there was a minority, like at least what I hear Leslie describing is, of folks who had kind of woken up and smelled bad coffee. Yeah and were aware of what was going on around them in a way that the larger majority, it sounds like, um, for whatever reason, and, and it's interesting because they're so intelligent and so insightful in so many areas of their life that yet they, they were not letting themselves take in what was really going on around them. I think that's a, I mean, thank you so much for asking that question. I mean, that's one of the big um, issues that I struggle with in doing the book. And I've thought so much about that. And I, you know, I don't have a, a, a great answer for you, but I will tell you sort of where I now stand on all of that. Um, I think, look, for all of us in this room, you know, for me in particular, I mean, I, I, I cannot remember a time in my life when I did not know about the Holocaust. You know, it is so present for so many of us. It is this sort of major event that shapes the way that we see the, not just the world today, but also the world of the past. You know, we, we tend to see um, you know, the, the, the long history of anti-Semitism in Europe culminating in Auschwitz, which in some ways it does, but I think, you know, that's actually, um, it, it doesn't serve you well in history writing, I think, as I've come to see, because, you know, what's so haunting to me about the Camondo Museum is basically what you say, like, how could these people not have seen the writing on the wall? Well, I think if we ask that question, we have to ask ourselves, do we really understand our own times? You know, do we smell the bad coffee today? And I think, you know, it's, it's not ever possible to see the future. You cannot know what's going to happen. And, 
you know, I for one have been wrong about everything since 2016. So um, <laughs> I, you just, you just don't know. And I think the same is true in, the, in, in that, like, you know, these were people who, many of the characters that I write about in the book lived and died before the Holocaust. So the, the generation that gave these collections to France, yes, there was loads of anti-Semitism. Yes, it was terrible and horrible. But they didn't have that reference frame of Auschwitz in mind because it was beyond comprehension, as it is even now. And so I think, you know, it's a mistake on our end to judge them in that sense because what they were trying to do was to contribute and to belong. And doing so, I don't think was foolish. I think it was very brave. And you know, the fact that the story ended in a way that they could not have ever imagined or foreseen, you know, it's not really their fault and we can't really hold them accountable for that because it's really impossible to, to see the future. And I just, um, it's very difficult though to, to, to say that because of course for us it seems so clear. But you know, it never is in the moment, and especially before things evolve as such. So I really struggle with that a lot, but I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough one. We have one final question from the congregation. Um, I was going to ask this earlier. It's very clear to me that in your book, um, you know, the German Jews wanted to be German first and Jewish second, and the French Jews wanted to be French first and Jewish second. And that never worked out for, for either of them. Uh, it seems to me here in the United States or in America, uh, we sort of have achieved that too. I mean, there's anti-Semitism in the country, no question, but I, I would think that most people think of me as an American and not a Jew, you know? And that's, that's religion here is sort of secondary. Uh, and I realize you're not a historian, but more. But, and, but do you have any thoughts about that? And, and you just touched on, we don't know the future. You know, uh, things can change in this country radically too. We don't really know. That's the last. That's just something I thought of. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a big question. I'm not sure I have a, a good answer for that one. Um, well, I would just say that I think that. Um, for the folks that um, James is describing and uh, from my own research, I think these people did feel the same way. They felt French, they felt German. And one of the reasons I think that so many of them wound up uh, in the camps is that they did not read the, the writing on the wall. They felt very, very secure and could not have imagined that their country would turn on them. They, they really did not. Um, you say that's I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, James has an article that's about to come out in the New Yorker about the, uh, the election that's occurring today. Matter of fact, the results of this French election will be known today at 2 p.m. when we will find out whether the, uh, the Marine Le Pen, the Holocaust denier, uh, the daughter of the ardent Holocaust denier, yeah. or, or Macron will prevail, God willing. Um, so I commend to you his, his article. But uh, in speaking about Holocaust remembrance, I would just like James to say a word about his next project, which um, deals with this very subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just in brief, the next project is about the kind of post-war fight for Holocaust memory in Europe, so right after the effect. So, you know, your, your question earlier about why was there no, why was there silence um, after the war um, is, is of, is of um, huge interest to me, because I, I think that, you know, again, um, someone like me, born in 1989, um, right around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, there was never a moment in my entire education or childhood when, you know, the the memory of the Holocaust was not a whole sort of established thing. And you know, there were books about it, films about it every year. I mean, it's very present, especially in American culture. But that wasn't always so. And I think we forget how much of a fight it was to establish and what a construction it was, and it takes different forms in different places um, in Europe, Israel, Soviet bloc, the US, and I find all of those sort of um, fights and battles very interesting, and it's a huge topic, but the book will be a sort of narrative approach to some of those, so that's what it is. Thank you. Well, I strongly commend the New Yorker article and 
The House of Fragile Things is a terrific read. I hope you'll, well, thank you after so much. this program, as uh, Rabbi Shankman said, we'll be having a book sale and signing before we go into the Free Youth Wing. So thank you all, and thanks to you so very much. And I'd like to thank, we're not done quite yet, although it's okay if you need to, to get up. Uh, we will be concluding shortly, but um, I want to thank James, Dr. McCauley, James, <laughs> again, for your informative, engage, engaging, poignant presentation this morning, and even more so for your beautiful book. There were pages of, um, of comments and praise and uh, all rightly deserved. And if you don't know, if you haven't read it yet, but you are um, certainly inspired to now, certainly you can purchase the book today and have it signed. You can also purchase it through our WHC Mitzvah Mall or support a local bookseller as well. Uh, and it was certainly the, the perfect uh, presentation, the most fitting topic for our inaugural Leslie Maitland Lecture of the Amram Scholar Series. So honored that you could be with us for this day and, and for this moment. Um, the rabbis of the Talmud speak of a prayer of thanksgiving that we're, we are to recite before we leave a house of study. And that prayer expresses gratitude for the opportunity to learn together, to have studied alongside one another. And Leslie Maitland, we know, has provided us with many, many profound opportunities to study and learn with one another at Washington Hebrew <laughs> Congregation. Uh, I have known Leslie for all of my 21 years here, in fact, meeting her as I came to visit and, uh, and certainly recall in my first weeks here the amount of time and energy she spent with Rabbi Lustig planning for upcoming Amram Scholar Series. I arrived in June, and they were hard at work putting together and crafting what would be a, uh, a beautiful and meaningful uh, season and, and year of study and learning for Washington Hebrew Congregation. I know many of you are familiar with her history with the Amram Scholar Series, just to highlight a few pieces of that. In 1998, when Rabbi Joseph Weinberg of Blessed Memory learned of Leslie's educational and professional background as both an alumna of the Harvard Divinity School, but I thought it was Chicago. A Chicago undergrad, uh, that's what we shared in common, and a former reporter for the New York Times, he enlisted her to help run the Amram Scholar Series. And for 23 years, Leslie has poured her heart and soul into her dedicated mission of sustaining this exceptional lecture series. She tirelessly organized, planned, arranged, coordinated, publicized, and moderated hundreds of topical lectures and events before stepping down this past year. And she's remained committed to preserving the vision of the founders of the Amram series with three basic guidelines. Our focus remained nonfiction, with all speakers recognized as respected authorities on their varied subjects. Every lecture included some Jewish aspect or insight, and we kept events free and open to the public, which meant many enthusiastic followers from the broader community joined our Amram audiences. Over the decades, our sanctuary and our chapel has been, have been full, with congregants and community members who have come to hear renowned, notable, credible, august scholars, authors, theologians, journalists, ambassadors, top government officials, as well as authorities on literature, art, music, science, theater, cinema, and photography. Uh, a very partial list of the inspirational speakers Leslie has prevailed upon to speak in the scholar series includes Elie Wiesel, Amos Oz, Oz, Susan Sontag, Madeline Albright, Samantha Power, Floyd Abrams, Deborah Lipstadt, Ari Shavit, Senator Joseph Lieberman, Defense Secretary William Cohen, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman and Nicholas Kristof, Dennis Ross, the Shakespeare Theater's Michael Kahn, as well as prominent rabbis such as Harold Kushner and Arthur Hertzberg, with whom we both learned and studied, another thing we shared in common. And everywhere that Leslie goes, uh, still, She's always prowling for Amram speakers and often came home with business cards that led to some of our best events. When Senator Joe Lieberman came to speak, he opened by genially saying that he had no choice, as Leslie had become such a constant nudge in beseeching him to speak to, for us. Um, so we are certainly proud and, um, and grateful to Leslie. And I asked Leslie to reflect on a few of her top moments, her favorite speakers and events. I know one of these was, was listed in the journal, but to, to share it again, at the very top of her list was a festive program in which the University of Chicago's New Budapest Orpheum Society turned our social hall into a candlelit Weimar-era cabaret, 
with a live performance of songs by Kurt Weill and his European Jewish contemporaries. To be sure, a lecture on their music was part of their program. Another year, Steve Katz of Blood, Sweat, and Tears came with his guitar to share his music along with stories of his life as a Jewish rock star. Over the years, Leslie's used creativity, contacts, and negotiating skills to ensure that Washington Hebrew would continue to provide excellent and engaging speakers. And to that end, she enrolled us as participating sites in the Jewish Book Council, enabling access to a larger pool of potential speakers. Leslie first encountered the JBC as a touring author herself with a publication in 2012 of her own nonfiction book, Crossing the Borders of Time, a true story of war, exile, and love reclaimed, on which she spoke in the Amram Scholar Series here and at venues across the country. Leslie expanded her work with the Jewish Book Council beyond the Amram Scholar Series, finding speakers for other groups and programs across Washington Hebrew. And having worked on the coordination side with her for a few years, I know, I know and appreciate how much time and energy she has expended juggling scores of speakers, dates, moderators, Zoom links, balancing the needs and desires of rabbis along with the needs and the desires of the congregation, often writing publicity as well. We are so incredibly grateful to Leslie. I personally am grateful for her guidance and mentorship and want to assure her that Washington Hebrew Congregation remains committed to fulfilling her vision of engaging more and younger congregants in these thought-provoking programs and continuing to uphold the highest values and, uh, and level of scholarship and intellectual uh, interest of these speakers. So it's fitting that we recognize Leslie's devoted volunteer service to Washington Hebrew Congregation by honoring her with an annual Amram lecture, today's being our inaugural lecture. And, uh, and in a little while, we'll have a chance to toast Leslie. Um, but first, I would like to invite our president of Washington Hebrew Congregation, Mark Director, to make a presentation on behalf of the congregation. And I believe Leslie may want to say a word or two following that as well. So Leslie, mazel tov to you. We thank you. I will be very brief because I'm standing between you and your bagel. Um, first, James, thank you very much. That was really, I thought it was a fascinating presentation. I think everyone here did, and I look forward to reading the book as a result of listening to what you had to say. It was, it was really terrific. Thank you. Um, Leslie, on behalf of the clergy, the staff, the lay leadership, and the entire membership of Washington Hebrew, uh, we want to say thank you, and we have a gift for you. Uh, it is a beautiful Tree of Life book stand uh, with a plaque that commemorates your work on the AMRAM lecture series. Um, we hope that you'll use this book stand regularly and that it will remind you of how grateful we all are for all you have done and how appreciative we are uh, for the past and the impact it's going to have on our future and for being such a dedicated and inspiring member of the congregation. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. I knew I'd be too uh, moved to just speak off the cuff, but <laughs> and I really want to say that um, I thank you both for your magnificent words of appreciation. I'm so deeply, deeply touched by today's event. And honestly, I could not imagine such a thoughtful and beautiful gift, but also, and especially, the honor of having an Amram lecture bear my name each year. I could not even think of anything more totally meaningful and, and, and just uh, beautiful. So I thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'm, of course, so delighted that, James, you could be our first Leslie Maitland speaker because you exemplify both with your enthusiasm and with your you know, deep research what I've always sought for in choosing Amram lectures. And uh, so I thank you for sharing your knowledge and the spotlight today for this event. 
It's certainly true that the Amram Scholars Series was a major, major focus of my life and energy for the past 23 years. And I'm thankful, so thankful that the temple, Rabbi Lustig and successive temple presidents um, always supported me in that mission. I want to salute my um, loyal Amram audience for your participation and showing up all the time, even on Zoom during the pandemic. I'm so grateful to members of the temple staff who devoted their efforts to the program, arranging travel for our speakers, ordering and selling books, handling publicity, providing technical expertise. I have to give a special shout out to Lainey Weiss and to uh, Mohan Mistry, who even helped create a stage in the sanctuary for the whirling dervishes to perform, uh, which was quite a feat, and which I linked to Judaism in the fact that their dance could be seen as uh, a window into understanding Hasidic dancing and kind of mystical form of Judaism. <laughs> It was a very difficult emotional decision for me to step aside from Amram last summer. And today, as we come together in person for the first time in over two years, I'm reminded of all the many reasons that I cherish this program and my, my involvement in it. First, it's a joy to provide an opportunity for important thinkers to, to share their work with us. It's enlightening always to come to Temple to learn about something entirely new with every program. And it's a blessing to come together in friendship with all of you. Uh, now, I can only say, especially after today, uh, coming together, that Rabbi Shankman uh, has been doing a stellar job in carrying the program forward through this most challenging of times. And I'm delighted to be part of the audience and look forward to watching Ambram go from strength to strength for many years to come. So thank you all so, so much. Leslie, we, we thank you, and certainly if I'm doing even a slightly decent job, it's only because I had the best teacher and continue to be a guide in, in this work. So thank you.